Our guest today is Hal Leith from Golden, Colorado, who has a unique story to tell us regarding the episode in World War II in the Pacific on the rescue of General Wainwright and other prisoners of war right at the end of the Second World War. Hal, can you tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and that's just, just a little storyline? Well, I was actually born in Butte, Montana, but I uh, lived for a while in Golden <coughs> in 1919. And uh, <clears throat> from there we went to Salt Lake City, where I went to school. And after I'd been in college in California for a couple of years, I went back to Salt Lake City and was a music major with opera. So I began by studying uh, French and German and, and singing in those languages. And uh, at that point, too, I also got interested in Russian opera. And so I started studying Russian, too. And uh, around 1941 or so, I went back to Washington, D.C. and worked in the Library of Congress for a while. I lived with a Russian family, and um, I was in charge of a, a program for propaganda at the library. And then I got the word that the Japanese had attacked us, and uh, so I went out to San Francisco where my mother was living, and I got drafted into the Army. And uh, that was the beginning of my Army career. And you took training in California? Yes. In Monterey, California, I took, took some training. And they decided that since I already had French and German, that I should probably learn Chinese. And where did you do that? Where did you go to school for Chinese training? Well, uh, first I went to uh, a special camp uh, just close to Los Angeles. It used to be a racetrack. Santa Anita. Santa Anita. Santa Anita, California. And uh, after a few nights there, and I was getting ready for the Chinese uh, study, I went to a, uh, a dance where they had USO hostesses. And when I uh, walked in, I looked at all of the USO hostesses, and one was smiling. And she's sitting here right now. And that was 63 years ago. And I taught her how to rumba, how to tango, because I was also a dance expert. Well, you were a music expert, language expert, dance expert, and you had good choice in women. And then I had to go to uh, the University of Chicago and about halfway through the year there, why I proposed to her and sent her a, a, a ring. And uh, then I went out a little bit later, and I um, got her to wear the ring. And been married ever since. <laughs> and uh, then I finished the school afterwards. And then after the school was finished, then one day, we had a guy come to talk to us to see if we wanted to do a certain job. And this guy called his company OSS, Office of Strategic Services. What it would today we call the CIA, the Central Intelligence Well, it was Agency. OSS, and then later became SSU. It evolved. Then it became CIG, then it became CIA. Well, you were just telling us about being recruited by the OSS, then what happened after that? Well, up to this point, <clears throat> we had started out with 80 pupils, and if your grade ever went below 90, you were kicked out. And I kept going and kept going, and I was the only one that made a special effort with the instructors on weekends to study the writing of Chinese characters. So most of them were just practicing speaking. Uh -huh. And uh, then the guy talked about 
working behind enemy lines and learning to uh, fight barehanded and with a knife and stuff like that. And would, would we like to join OSS? And at this point, there were only about 20 of us left. And uh, most of them said, no, we don't want to go for a thing like that. And there were about six of us agreed to join Out OSS. Out of the 20, yeah. So at, at that point, I went to Washington, D.C. and had a little beginning training in what OSS was. Then we went out to the island of Catalina and uh, got a lot of special training on how to be secretive, how to uh, be able to control yourself by bare hands if somebody tried to attack you. So manual. So they taught you everything. Uh, yeah, and uh, also how to use uh, secret ink and things like that. And uh, after a bit of training, went back to Washington again for some more training along that line. And uh, then they said, well, it's getting time to go. So they sent me out to a camp near Los Angeles. And I saw Helen a little bit. And then uh, we got on a, a boat and headed for India. And we were in Melbourne for a couple of days. And at that point, we got word that the president was gone and that we had a new president named Truman. And most of the guys didn't know who Truman was. I was the only one that did. That's interesting. Who's Truman? Yes. <laughs> so. Um, we then got into India, stayed a couple of three weeks, and then started heading for China. And we went up into Burma and at an airport there, they sent two airplanes full of uh, those of us who uh, were going to Kunming, China. And uh, we we took off, and then the other airplane took off after us. And uh, one thing about the Himalayas is that you can't fly over them because they're too high. You have to fly up the valleys. And then, well, that sounds like fun. <laughs> and uh, we uh, got there safely. And. Uh, <clears throat> Right after landing, I, I was talking with the Chinese and, and uh, having no problems whatsoever. And I could read their, all of their signs and everything, too. But then I found out that the second airplane hadn't made it up and over. They had made it into a peak. And they never made it. Oh, wow. So we were the only ones from that group. Did, and uh, the I was called an SI yeah. officer at that point, special intelligence because I had the languages. And I had, uh, well, at the University of Chicago, at one point they thought I should study Russian since I already knew some. And then when I talked to the Russian instructor, he says, you're fluent in Russian. You don't need any study. So I didn't uh, study any more That's Russian. But in China, I was <clears throat> the only person around that spoke both Russian and Chinese, as well as uh, French and, and uh, German. But um, after we had the atomic bombs in, uh, in Japan, we began to have meetings about possible surrender. And uh, I was asked if I would volunteer to go in to a camp in northeast China where they thought General Wainwright was. And there was a good deal of fear that the, J the J Japanese would kill some of the prisoners. Because we found out during the uh, some of the early uh, surrender of the Japanese that they were actually killing POWs in, in some areas. And uh, they wanted people who were paratroopers. And I had studied paratrooping because there was no time to go up 
all the way to Manchuria in the Mukden, uh, unless you uh, could get there fast. So we flew up to Xi'an, northwest China, and stayed a couple of days, and then about 4.30 in the morning, on, it was the 16th there and the 15th of August. 1945. In 1945. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, so we left about 4.30, and uh, about 10 o'clock, the pilots told us all that uh, they were having 20 mile an hour winds, would it be safe to jump? So we all said we thought we couldn't wait any longer, we'd le leave the POWs there. And uh, so we agreed to jump, and <clears throat> we were in a B-24, and uh, there was a hole in the middle bottom and we sat around that, and they said, jump, and I was the fourth one to jump out. And you felt like you were floating for a while, and then all of a sudden, you heard that loud pop, and it was the chute opening. And it's one of the best sounds I've ever heard. <laughs> that great sound of the chute. <laughs> yeah, I like that. And uh, when we landed, we found that most of the people who were down there were Chinese farmers, so I had no, prob no problem talking to them. And uh, they, uh, one of them said that we were about an hour's walk away from them, and this guy would take us up there. And uh, the airplane that we had jumped, jumped from turned around, came back, dropped our supplies, radio gear, food, medicine, stuff like that. And as they left, a Japanese fighter plane headed right for that plane, our plane, the uh -huh. B-24. And uh, he, uh, he saw the guy coming and hauled back on the wheel. And he went up, and the Japanese plane went underneath, and they never shot. So uh, Good thing they didn't both our, pull back on the wheel. Our guy got back <laughs> safely. Yeah. So uh, after about a, well, let's see, four of us started to walk with this Chinese. And when we got about 20 to 30 minutes north of where we were standing, a group of Japanese soldiers came down the, the little road and found out got down on their hands and knees, cocked their rifles, and pointed their bayonets and rifles at us. And at that point, the doctor, who was standing next to me, he said, I'm going to go down fighting. And he reached for his 45. Oh. And I said, you make a move, and I'll get you myself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so he didn't. And at that point, out from the bushes on the left-hand side, except the rest of the Japanese squad where they'd been hiding, if he had pulled a gun out, they would have killed you. They would have killed all of us. Wow. The, do uh, the doctor later on says that I saved the uh, operation. There were, there four, I thought there were six of you when you landed, were they? Yes. Two stayed behind, did they? Well, the Chinese officer who came stayed down where the supplies where were the supplies. dropped, and he disappeared. He ran away. He was afraid of the Japanese. But there were the, uh, a couple of others. And the doctor finally was sent back to uh, get supplies and uh, get the, uh, the other guy, our communications guy, and bring him. And we were taken by the Japanese into a little hut. And uh, then we were, had blindfolds put over us, and we were tied up. And, uh, we talked to them and talked to them, and I, I found some of, the Chinese, some of the Japanese who spoke Chinese, and that none of them knew that they were supposed to surrender, though they refused to surrender. And then after our people showed up from where we jumped in a small truck, they took us into town where we met with the chief of the Kempeitai, which is the Japanese secret police, and they... Um, 
chief of the Kempertai was a colonel, and he said, well, uh, you're no longer going to be a POW with me. You're just going to be a guest for now, but, and I will contact Tokyo and find out about surrender. So they didn't know that the war had ended, even at that level? No, they didn't. No. And uh, <clears throat> there was one uh, Japanese who kept pointing, when we, when we guys would talk with each other, he'd point his bayonet at us and say, no talk, no talk. And uh, so back in the Kempeitai headquarters, we asked if we could go out and talk to somebody at the POW camp. And he says, I don't think that the commander, will, Commander Colonel Matsuda, will let you do that, but we'll let you go out and, and just uh, see what you can see. And then you have to make arrangements first thing in the morning to come, and I'll tell you the results of the, uh, my talking with Tokyo. And as we're getting on the truck, and it was raining a little bit, this Japanese who kept saying, no talk, no talk, uh, he had heard me talking before, and he walked up to me and he said, hey, I'm from L.A., I wonder if you know my brother. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> so uh, we were, went out and talked to the uh, <clears throat> Colonel Matsuda, and he absolutely would not let us make any conversation with POWs. And I could see some up in the windows up above. And I waved at him and went, OK. And they understood waved. you? Well, the funny thing is, at POW yearly meetings several years ago, one of them said, you're the big redhead who, who signaled OK to us. Oh, well, how charming. <laughs> So uh, anyway, they sent us into the Yamada Hotel in town, beautiful Japanese hotel, and they fed us and uh, then put us to bed. And uh, the next morning, about 8.30, we went across the, uh, there's a big circle there, and across the circle is where the Kempeitai was from the hotel. And uh, I walked up to the, Colonel, and he said, I have been told to surrender to you, so we are all surrendering to you, and I would like to commit Harry Carey. Would you he, like to come and watch? He wants you, want you to watch it. That's interesting. And yeah. I said, no, we don't want you to be hurt, <laughs> and we want you to be sure that your people treat us all nicely and the POWs nicely. Don't do anything bad. And he said, well, okay. And that was the end of that, and then we went directly out to the camp and we walk into the, well, Colonel Matsuda met us, and then he took us into a, down a long hallway to where his office was, and we went in and sat around, and he looked at us and frowned. He didn't like, he didn't like Americans huh? sitting around by them. By them. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, we told him that we wanted to see the the senior officer, American officer there, and uh, we thought that it should be General Wainwright. And a couple of minutes later, in the door comes General Parker. And General Parker said, no, Wainwright is not here. He's in another camp about 150 miles northeast of here. So at that point, I says, well, it's time that we let these POWs out in the drive in the, well, there's a, a courtyard outside. It's time to let them know that they're going home. So I ran down the hall and out the door and called them all together and said, you're going home, the Japanese have surrendered. So the war is over for, for you all and you're no longer POWs. And they were just absolutely delighted and I had a million questions some of which I couldn't answer, but things like, uh, let's Baseball see. and who's, who's president and all that sort of stuff? Well, they asked, uh, yeah, I told them who was president, but, uh, and 
one of them asked me on baseball who won the, the World Series this year, last year, two mm -hmm. years ago. How important. <laughs> and I knew a couple of them, but not all of them. And then he asked about our very famous little uh, queen of the movies. Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple. Is Shirley Temple still alive? And I said, yes, she, she is. And oh, they were all very happy. And at that point, I went back in because knowing that General Wainwright was a distance off, I got together with the doctor and uh, we decided that the safest thing would be for the doctor and me to catch a train uh, first thing the next morning and head for this new camp, uh, new to us now. And uh, we had also found out at this camp that of the 1,600 POWs who were there, that that very morning uh, it would have been a disaster if we hadn't uh, jumped in. They had called up 300 POWs, given them bags of some food, and had made arrangements to march them out into the hills and get rid of them. Just exactly what you were afraid of when you started the mission. That's what we were afraid of. Yeah. So that, that's interesting. We were so you busy to stop, yeah. stop that. And then, uh, so we decided that the doctor would go if there was health, and I would go because of my language capabilities. So we got on the train in the morning and spent all day heading toward his camp, and his camp was named Xi'an, the same one that we took off from in the airplane, except his is Xi'an in northeast China, and the other one was in southwest China. How far away is this from your first camp? About 150 miles, and it took us all day, and then we had to change trains a couple of times. And we finally got into the city, Xi'an, at 4.30 the next morning, and uh, we were taken, because we had a Japanese, an armed Japanese group that was making sure things were safe for us. It was also interesting when we were stopped in one place, I saw white Russians outside the train talking, and so I turned and talked to them in, uh, in Russian, and they were very surprised and wanted to know where, where I was from, and I told them I was an American. And, I said, well, you speak fluent Russian. So uh, I said, well, yes, but I'm, you I'm an American. Be, you're American. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we went, we were taken out to the camp, which is on a, hill, a hilltop just on the east side of the city. And uh, they gave us some cots to sleep on and made arrangements to have General Wainwright and General King and the British general to meet with them first thing in the morning when they, when they, get, when they woke up. And uh, you so met with them at the camp? It's a, the camp itself? You got into the camp? Is that yes, that's we were inside the camp. And, uh, we didn't have any trouble talking to this camp commander because he was a graduate of Oregon State University. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and he understood that they had surrendered at this point. The well, he had gotten the word, yes. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, we met and we had the pleasure of telling all of these people and we also got the word to the Dutch generals and the British generals and their governors from different, uh, the Netherlands, Netherlands East Indies had a, uh, a governor there and uh, Governor Sir Mark Young of Hong Kong was, was there. There were about 30 people in there and I have a list uh, which I have offered you Yes. That has the names of all of the POWs who, who were in, in this particular camp. 
And the next day we found out was going to be General Wainwright's 42nd, 62nd, 62nd birthday. 62nd birthday. And uh, so we made arrangements and I took some pictures of him and his aide de camp. And they took, got a picture of me also with General Wainwright. And Wainwright was very afraid that the Americans considered him as a traitor because MacArthur had told him that you must not surrender to the Japanese, you have to fight them to the end. And I says, the Americans recognize that if you hadn't surrendered, all of these POWs that we have here wouldn't be here, they'd all be dead. So uh, I said, you're a hero as far as all the Americans are concerned. Not a villain. Not a villain. Yep. So where did you get the food to, or the uh, product to make a birthday cake? Did the Red Cross? Well, it turns out the Red Cross had left supplies there, which had never been given to them because they, they weren't, didn't want them to, to, to eat. Uh, in my book, you'll see a picture of me. I weighed 173 pounds. General Wainwright's standing alongside me, but he's wearing a shirt to hide his arms because he only weighed 98 pounds, and he was just skin and bones. Was he badly treated in the camp? Yeah, some of the Japanese uh, private types uh, used to slap him around wow. in the face. And... Uh, so he had a hard time with them. <laughs> Sounds like it, yes. And we did a good deal of talking, and I had uh, uh, talked with all of the uh, people there. Uh, Sir Mark Young and I used to play uh, chess together. Uh -huh. He beat me all the time, so he gave me his book on how to play chess, <laughs> how to play which chess. I still have. He's trying my... to tell you something, wasn't he? Yeah, so I learned. <laughs> And uh, think, think you but could we had a lot of talk, and yeah. uh, and I, after well, the doctor left the second day to go back to Mukden to try and get arrangements because they would not let us take a train out of there at that point. And we got uh, about four or five more days. About six days later, all of a sudden. You could see down into the city, there were some big trucks coming in, and they all had red flags. So I f told General Wainwright that they're probably Russians, and I would go down and talk with them, see what I could get. So uh, I, I got the Lieutenant, Lieutenant Marui, who was the camp commander. He and I went down, and I talked to the Russian, uh, a two-star Russian general, and I talked to him and told him that uh, I had been there several days, and he didn't like that. And he also said, how are you speaking fluent Russian? You're not, you don't have a Russian name. <laughs> he didn't like you that must, either. <laughs> and he said, you must be a spy. Well, I denied it, even though it was true. <laughs> and uh, so uh, when he said, we can't, you can't take a train. I will send a squad of people with a colonel in charge up to the camp this evening, and you, you will have to get uh, some uh, buses and trucks, and we're going to drive you cross-country back to Mukden, starting about 6.30 that evening. So I went back, and uh, Lieutenant Marui got me all the vehicles that we needed, and I got everybody ready and got them packed. And as we're getting on these buses, General Wainwright calls all of these people together, all 30 of them, and said, Leith here is in charge. You'll do whatever he tells you. Well, that was the so day. So I was promoted. <laughs> you were promoted on the spot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we took off, and it was raining some. And we got to a Chinese village, and they, they gave us dinner that evening. They were very nice. But going uh, along the roads, they were slippery, and we'd occasionally go off to the side. And I would get Chinese and talk to them, and they would 
come and push and get a bunch of people and help us to get going again. But when we got to railroad, uh, or rather to rivers, only a railroad trestle could be used to get the buses over because the buses did not have any road bridges. So I got everybody to walk across the trestle and I got the cars and buses up there and then I would walk in front of them and motion them and keep them, get them over on the other side and then back down onto the road on the other side of the river. This is a trestle for just one train track? Yes. A very narrow one. Yes, no. it was narrow, so, but the, the, wow. the, the, <laughs> the wheels would, just were just on each side. On the ties, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that was working. And we got a couple of days along and uh, <clears throat> We uh, got to a village where suddenly a train showed up, and uh, so we decided that they would take us to the a, a place called Supingai. That's the Chinese uh, name, and uh, it was on the main railroad track. So we thought maybe we could get the Russians to let us take it from that point on. And we got part way, and they ran out of fuel, so we had to get out, and uh, they got word uh, a little further along, and they got another train to come in and pick us up and took us in. And we arrived there in the morning. This is the third morning. And we met a Chinese colonel who was in charge of the, the uh, train the trains that are coming through there, and uh, we had lunch together. And, uh, well, are the Russians in charge at this point? Yes, the Russians had come had taken at this over. point, had taken over, and they agreed finally, late in the afternoon, to take us all to Mukden. We got on the train and left and got into Mukden, into the train station about 12.30 in the morning. And uh, the, colonel, the Russian colonel and I walked toward the, uh, the hotel that, where we'd been staying. And I, I asked people from time to time, where were the, where were the Americans? And uh, I asked them in Russian, of course, and then they'd say, oh, you mean Pianitsi? You mean the drunkards? Well, the, drunkard. the Russians had been feeding them vodka all along. Oh, so all these POWs, you mean? Yeah, no, these were the uh, the rest of our group. Well, our that's your group. <laughs> yeah, my group. We're now feeling happy. And the doctor agreed to go down to the train with me and help to get some of the people in. So we got General Wainwright King and Moore and, and so on into the hotel. And then I, I couldn't sleep all that night. I didn't sleep for three days and nights. I was busy all the time. But I... Uh, finally got everybody in where it was safe. And uh, first thing in the morning, we got General Wainwright King and Moore and General Parker and took pictures of them there and decided that we'd take them out to the airport. I, I got the word that there was a plane waiting for them. It turned out to be a, a C-46. And uh, there was a B-24 there, too, but they got on the C-46. And uh, when uh, we uh, were putting him on the plane, General Wainwright called all of his staff together there and introduced me to them and told everybody that I had as much uh, skill and rank as any good major. So I was promoted again. You were promoted again. You did get promoted, did you? Yeah, I, I had been a staff sergeant yeah. when I arrived. <laughs> so um, anyway, we got them up and got them on the airplane, and they were able to start back. And then I spent time out at the POW camp, because the Russians had also moved into the POW camp and taken over control of it, too. But we beat them to it, and they never liked that. They never liked that, no. <laughs> and then uh, later, around March or April, why we moved back into uh, Hong Kong. And at that point, 
the agency asked OSS asked me to. By that by that time, it was now being called SSU. Uh, asked me to come to uh, to uh, their headquarters in China, and they suggested that I uh, get get out of the army at that point. So I, I got out of the army, and they offered me a uh, civilian job, which had the comparative rank of uh, full colonel. So when I would fly on airplanes or do something, I was treated like a big shot. So you had risen from corporal to colonel. That's a pretty good jump. To to master sergeant to, to sergeant to staff to sergeant I, to staff sergeant. I, I like that. That's a, to to <laughs> civilian. To civilian. Yeah. You like that too. Yeah. So that that really ended your military career then. And we got a car and drove back to Washington D.C. and I started working overtly as the the expert on Soviets as well as Ch Chinese. As a civilian. As a civilian. Yeah. 